So thank you once again for coming in for, for Tin Mountain's nature, uh, nature program series, Astronomy 101. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank Tin Mountain's nature program series sponsors, and they are Hancock Lumber, White Mountain Oil and Propane, and Ragged Mountain Equipment. Um, so we do, uh, we do thank them for their financial support that allows us to, to put on programs such as this. I also want to thank all of you who are watching right now who are current members of Tin Mountain. Your membership dollars help us to fulfill our mission and to continue putting on quality programming. So thank you to all of our current members. If you are not a member of Tin Mountain, we would encourage you to consider doing so. Um, you can do that right on our website, tinmountain.org. In the upper right-hand corner, there is a support us tab. Um, so there is membership information there. There's also information there about simply um, donating to Tin Mountain's nature program series um, if membership isn't right for you right now, but you do wanna help uh, financially support our programming, we would encourage you to, to explore those tabs. Um, and in addition to the two bird walks that I mentioned that are going on uh, in the you know, north of the notch and uh, you know, in the southern part of the valley this weekend, next week, um, we have coming up, we're excited on Thursday, May 19th, we have Chris Louie of Raven, Raven Interpretive Programs will be presenting um, a virtual evening program on the Atlantic Puffin. So uh, it's been a number of years since he's done that. Um, a great program. And then on Saturday, May 21st, we have our annual meeting, which we'll be hosting at the Nature Learning Center in Albany. Um, we are uh, anticipating uh, doing the entire meeting outside. We have several field trip options. Uh, before the meeting, which starts at 11.30 a.m., um, and then there is a luncheon. And um, following the luncheon, our executive director, Lori Kinsey, will be um, leading through a presentation and walk across the street at the Accessible Nature Trail that, um, that is currently under construction. So uh, we're hoping for, for this type of weather so that we can host that whole program um, whole program outside and you can see a whole schedule of, um, of the day at our website, um, tinmountain.org. But moving, you know, shifting gears to tonight, um, to the very, very vast topic of astronomy, hence the Astronomy 101, there's only so much to cover. Um, we are very excited because as, you know, as I just said, astronomy is a, no pun intended, vast topic. Um, and, and often it's one that, that many of us struggle to, uh, to understand, or we may only be familiar with it with very small aspects, um, constellations or such. So we're very excited uh, to have Dan Noren presenting tonight um, and, and to have him, you know, welcoming him into the membership of, of Tin Mountain. Um, he is a longtime uh, amateur astronomer and cosmologist. Um, he is a retired educator, high school teacher. So we we appreciate anyone who you know who teaches, uh, especially in the high school, um, and lots of um, educational experience teaching in um, NASA programs, including the Chandra Astrophysics. Astrophysics Institute, um, and he is also a past program manager for the Museum of Science in Boston. So we are very excited um, to uh, to welcome Dan Noren in presenting this program. Um, and I should say, as he's yes, as he's coming on screen, if you have um, if you have not joined us. Um, for a Zoom program before, or if it's been a while, um, I would encourage you if you have questions to type them into the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, I will be monitoring that. I will probably hold those questions until the end because there's a good possibility that your question might be answered um, down the line in Dan's program. So with that said, um, I am going to, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to hand things over to Dan. 
Well, good evening. Hello. Welcome to the um, Tin Mountain Conservation Old Center Astronomy 101 program. Thank you for participating. My name is Dan Noren, and I will, over the next hour, um, you and I are going to be going on an extraordinary journey through the of, of the mind through time and space, the universe, and beyond. Um, the program uh, has a bunch of slides, has a bunch of videos and so forth. There's going to be some switching back and forth between that. And there's going to be some lecturing, not lecturing, but um, uh, I'm excited to talk about these types of things. Um, and so that's kind of a format for tonight. Now, <clears throat> Astronomy 101, we're going to be, we're going to be, first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little quote from um, Sixin Liu. He's a uh, science fiction writer in, in, um, in China. Um, the inconceivable thing about the universe is that it is conceivable. Now think about that for a couple of minutes, um, that we have something that uh, is hard to imagine, it's hard to describe the universe, um, and yet we can do and we're going to explore a lot about the universe. We're going to then explore about our sun. Um, and in the, in the meantime, um, we're going to um, explain a lot of things in the background. So just stay with us at this point in time. Okay, so the universe. Um, we're going to start to explore the universe. Its beginning, its current configuration, its future, and that's an interesting subject, um, and how we know about all this, okay? So in the beginning, there was nothing. And can you even begin to understand absolute nothingness? No space, no time, no matter, no energy, nothing, nothing. I mean, that boggles my mind. So let's talk about nothing, and then let's talk about the Big Bang, okay? So <clears throat> at the beginning, oops, I gotta do this. At the beginning over here, right here, right before that bright flash, there was nothing. And then all of a sudden, bang, it was everything in a point source that has no dimension, but it has infinitely hot energy. After that, in one second, which is called the Planck epoch, forces started to emerge from this explosion. Opaque hot plasma. Plasma is the fourth state of matter. It's a very hot gas. 18,000 years after that Big Bang, subatomic particles started to form. 47,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe starts to cool more matter than radiation, matter starts being formed. 100,000 years, atoms start to form, both matter and antimatter. Matter and antimatter annihilate each other and during that period of time and leaving very little antimatter and mostly matter. 370,000 years ago, now remember this is from the beginning of time, no time and then all of a sudden 370,000 years the universe becomes transparent to light. That's when we are able to see the first stars, hydrogen and helium. 500 million years, stars start to form, visible light emerges. 800 million years, stars gravitationally clump together into, to form galaxies like our Milky Way galaxy. 13.7 billion years is our current universe. So from that Big Bang, from that, let's see, let's see where we're going here, we're going over here. So from that Big Bang, we had a lot of energy, and then we had some particles forming, um, and then we had some stars forming. The stars started getting into galaxies, and then the galaxies, and this is a timeline as well. And now over here, we have what we see today in our universe. Now, here's another view of that, and it's heliocentric, which means the sun is in the middle. 
you can see here the sun in the middle and the planets around the sun. And then we go out to the outer edge of the universe, the visible universe. The first thing you see is the Milky Way. This is the Milky Way in a circular chrono. And then you see other galaxies outside of the Milky Way. And then you see galaxy clusters. These are clusters in space. You can't even imagine um, the volume we're talking about here. These are galaxies that are clustered together. And then we have super clusters of galaxy, and then we have the edge of the visible universe. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But what is this really made of? Okay, well, this is the universe as we know it now, out to 13.7 billion years, billion light years. But most, well, not most, but the, but the universe, the stuff that we could see in the universe, the observable universe, only is 5% of everything there. So that's called baryonic matter. It's the stuff that we can see and detect. It's some hydrogen, it's some helium, it's traces of other elements, molecules, gas and molecular dust, making up the stars, galaxies, black holes, things that we can see and detect, 5%. Then there's dark energy. No one has a clue as to what it is. Nobody can detect it. And that comprises 68% of the universe. How do we know about dark energy? We know about it from the effect on baryonic matter, okay? Dark energy is actually expanding our universe. So the universe started as, as an infinitesimal dot, remember? And then over the past 13.7 billion years, it has been expanding from that big event. But about 5 billion years ago, it started expanding on a rate that doesn't, it isn't explained by that explosion, okay? But it is explained by dark matter. Again, we don't know what it is, but we know that the universe is expanding faster, it's accelerating. And the only way we can try to figure out why that is, is to talk about this dark energy. So dark energy is causing the accelerating extent expansion of the universe, which means that everything in the universe is becoming further and further away from everything else. And then there's dark matter. Now, that takes up 27%. Now, remember, baryonic matter, the stuff that we can see and detect, is 5%. Dark energy is 68% of the universe. Dark matter is the other 27%. And again, like dark energy, we have no clue as to what it is. Dark matter, however, we can detect it, not directly, but indirectly, because of the missing mass of galaxies that exhibit uh, when the stars are going around in the galaxy, they're going around in a different way than what theory predicts. And they're saying this is because of dark, dark matter. And then we have what's called the cosmic uh, microwave background. That is the flash of light from the Big Bang that has been slowly redshifted from an intense gamma rays down to X-rays, down to um, radio, uh, down to um, light waves, down to microwaves, down to radio waves, down to um, microwave, uh, uh, microwave background. And it's light remnants of, of the Big Bang from the soup that existed in the stars spawned by the universe 13.7 light years ago. And then there's the edge of the observable universe. We, there's, the universe is bigger than this. Well, we can only see out 13.7 billion years, okay? There's stuff out there, but the light traveling at the speed of light hasn't had time to reach us yet. And so the, uh, the, we talk about um, the universes and stuff like that, but I wanna talk about it. So we talked about um, the beginning of the universe where we are now, and now we're gonna talk about, and we're gonna see a video about the future of the universe. And this is very, very interesting. So. Um, just hold on for a second while I reshare a video. Hey, smart people, Joe here. Now, I don't want to alarm you, but the world is going to end. All of this gone, poof. Adios. The sun swells into a red giant. The oceans boil away. Planets scorched, and scientists are certain that all this will happen. 
Now, I'm sorry if you're just hearing this from me, but I want you to know the truth. Now, on the bright side, this isn't gonna happen for four to five billion years. In a universe bigger than we can fathom, across eons of time, stars like the sun and planets like Earth, they blink out of existence all the time. But could all of it end? I mean, everything? The whole universe? Yes, and it probably will. I've been thinking about the end of the universe a lot lately, and I know what you're thinking. Hey, Joe, you okay? COVID finally getting to you? And don't worry, that's not why. It's because I've been reading this awesome book, The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking, by my friend, astrophysicist Katie Mack. It is great, and I have never had more fun learning about how everything will cease to be forever. This is Andromeda, a trillion stars whizzing around a supermassive black hole and the Milky Way's closest galactic neighbor. And it's headed this way right now. Andromeda is currently around two and a half million light years from Earth, but it is closing that distance at 110 kilometers per second on a crash course with our galaxy. In about four billion years, the galaxies will start to merge into one. Now, across the cosmos, galaxies collide on a regular basis, and we can see these collisions with powerful telescopes, even simulate these collisions on really, really, really big computers that go beep, boop, boop, and do hard math stuff. But these galactic mergers are becoming more rare because giant stuff like galaxies are drifting farther apart. I don't know, maybe they should check in once in a while, just send a text. It's not that hard. You set up a coffee date, catch up on old times. Actually, galaxies are drifting apart because the universe is expanding. And that expansion all started with one big push, the Big Bang. Think of the universe like this slinky. It started here. And since that push, the space between each rung of the spring has been getting slightly bigger. That's like neighboring galaxies. And as a result, the ends have gotten way farther apart because of the collective distance between all these small expansions happening within its boundaries. All that started with the Big Bang. The question is, will that initial push from the Big Bang eventually fizzle out? Think about it. Thanks to gravity, everything is always attracting everything else. That's why Andromeda and the Milky Way will one day collide. Now, the farther apart two objects are, the gravitational attraction between them does get weaker, but it never reaches zero. It seems like the gravity of everything in the universe should eventually pull it back in. So what happens if that expansion stops and goes in reverse? Doom. In a collapsing universe, the space between galaxies would get smaller and smaller. Collisions would become more frequent. Stars and planets flung out of orbit. Black holes ignite and merge, becoming even more massive. Matter whirling into these giant black holes is superheated by friction so hot that it shoots out jets of radiation scorching anything in their path. I mean, imagine rubbing two sticks together so hard that the fire that they create emits x-rays. It's like that. During these galactic crashes, some new stars will be born, even new planets, and some of them might even have time to develop life if they're not in the path of a sterilizing X-ray beam. But eventually, all of these too will be destroyed by fire. As the universe collapses, all of the energy that's ever been emitted by every star or drawn into any black hole will be squished into a smaller space and squeezed into higher energy wavelengths. This concentrated radiation will become so intense, the temperature of space will rise until nuclear explosions rip stars and planets apart, leaving space full of hot plasma. At this point, the universe resembles the early moments after the Big Bang. The temperatures and densities are so high, we don't actually have a way to describe them. Except really, really, really hot. That's three reallys, so you know it's bad. What if that crunch never happens? Well, today we think the universe isn't likely to snap back on itself, but turns out that's not such good news either. The heat death. When you throw a ball into the air, it slows down and falls back down. Okay, everybody knows that. But in the early days of the universe, things were close together, and so gravitational attraction slowed the outward push of the expansion from the Big Bang. And expansion was slowing down just like a falling ball, 
for a while. But in 1998, scientists discovered that about 5 billion years ago, the expansion of the universe started speeding up. And it's still speeding up. Like what would happen if you threw a ball up in the air and it kept going faster in the same direction forever? And the bigger our universe gets, the faster it's expanding. That's weird. Really, really, really weird. And it's three reallys, so you know it's weird. There's some mysterious property of empty space pushing outwards in all directions. And we call this dark energy. The more empty space there is, the more dark energy and the more it pushes. Dark energy might be a source of energy that never runs out and that we find everywhere there's empty space. Something that astrophysicists and cosmologists call a cosmological constant. And as the universe expands, it makes more empty space, which means more dark energy and the expansion gets faster and faster. On the nearby scale, other forces like gravity and electromagnetism are still strong enough to keep molecules together, your, your feet on the ground, our planet orbiting the sun and our galaxy from falling apart. But the vast spaces between galaxies are dominated by dark energy. The universe is already expanding faster than the speed of light, meaning that light emitted from galaxies beyond this point will always be moving away from us and will never reach Earth. And as that expansion speeds up, closer and closer galaxies will be outrun and they'll disappear from our view. Eventually, every galaxy will be alone in a dark universe. Nothing will approach anything else. The stars already shining will burn out over billions of years. A hundred billion years from now, the Milky Way will dim and eventually fade to black. Even black holes will evaporate. There's no fuel for new stars, just vast empty spaces left filled only with dark energy expanding forever. A slow death by loneliness, lasting hundreds of billions of years. It could be worse though. If dark energy actually gets more powerful over time, that, that, would, that would be so bad. The Big Rip. Meet phantom dark energy. It's like dark energy on steroids. Phantom dark energy would not only expand the space between things, but expand things themselves. Remember, in our universe today, fundamental forces are enough to hold things together, even as dark energy expands the universe as a whole. But phantom dark energy would be strong enough to overcome all of those other forces. It wouldn't just push galaxies apart. It would push stars away from galaxies, planets away from stars, tear planets apart. Eventually, atoms and molecules and particles would rip apart as phantom dark energy becomes stronger than the electromagnetic forces that hold them together. And in the final moments, the very fabric of space would be torn apart. A big rip. But don't worry, if the big rip is coming, it's not coming for like 200 billion years. So at this point, it might be nice to remind ourselves that both you and I will be dead by then. So hooray. But there's one scenario that might be less far off. It could happen anytime. It could be happening right now, but it destroys everything so fast you wouldn't feel it. And it all starts with a bubble. It's like a self-destruct button for the universe, setting off a wave of apocalypse moving at the speed of light. How could that happen? Something called vacuum decay. Now the Higgs field is a sort of energy field that permeates all of space. It surrounds us and penetrates us. It binds the galaxy together. <clears throat> the Higgs field sets the rules for physics on the scale of particles, like what particles exist, how they interact with each other, what their masses are, atoms and molecules and trees and people and planets for that matter are only able to hold themselves together and exist because the Higgs field has a particular value. If that value were slightly different, it could scramble all of that up. In fact, it was like this in the early universe. The Higgs field had a different value and there were different particles with different rules. The Higgs field is pretty stable. It's settled down here at a low energy, but there is a small chance that an ultra high energy explosion, the evaporation of a black hole or a quantum uh, event could kick the Higgs field to some lower value. 
this would create a sort of bubble in the Higgs field, a new kind of space with different rules. And this bubble would zip through the universe at the speed of light, ripping particles apart, swallowing everything in the bubble. And if it hit you, you'd be gone before your brain knew anything happened. Once this bubble destroys everything, the space inside it collapses into a black hole. And they all live happily never after. Don't worry, there's no way that we could trigger vacuum decay ourselves, but the universe might. Don't lose hope, though. We have one more scenario. What if the end isn't the end? There is another option. Cyclic universes? Some other more recent theories point to cycling universes, where the end of one is the beginning of another. But these theories involve ideas like anti-universes or parallel fabrics of space-time, but they would mean that an end really isn't an end at all. As we learn more, all of these theories may change, and we may even find some new ones. But understanding our universe so deeply that we could one day figure out its ultimate fate, as well as ours, well, that's a nice way to add meaning to a universe that we know won't last forever. And besides, None of this will happen for a very long time, like at least tens of billions of years, maybe more than a hundred billion. I guess unless it's vacuum decay. Stay Okay, so <clears throat> we, we just talked about um, the, uh, the beginning of the universe, um, the current state, and what may happen in the future as well. Um, again, like he said, uh, these are all theories, um, and nobody knows you know, which one is right and which one is wrong. So let's continue on a little bit. <clears throat> I wanna talk about some of the fundamentals of, uh, of astronomy, okay? Um, and the first one is, what is astronomy, okay? So we're gonna give a little definition of what that is. And... Mankind has looked up to the heavens since the start of civilization searching to put a meaning and an order and understanding to the universe that we live in. Astronomy is a branch of science that studies outer space. This focuses on celestial bodies such as stars, comets, planets and galaxies. Early astronomers noticed patterns in the sky and attempted to organise them in order to track and predict their motion. These are known as constellations and these patterns help people from the past to measure the seasons. The movement of the stars and all the other heavenly bodies was tracked around the world, but especially in China, Egypt, Greece, Mesopotamia, Central America, and India. Galileo Galilei made major improvements to the telescope, and this allowed close observations of the planets. He made many discoveries, including four major satellites of Jupiter, known as the Galilean moons, and later discovered spots on the sun, which of course are called sunspots. Johannes Kepler was a famous astronomer and mathematician, and he came up with the planetary laws of motion, and these describe how the planets orbit around the sun. Then Isaac Newton came along and explained the physics behind the solar system. He was using the laws of celestial dynamics and gravitation, these days, modern astronomy is done from observatories, from remote telescopes on the ground or in space, and these are controlled by computers. And these allow astronomers to study computer-generated data and images. Astronomy is the study of the sun, moon, stars, planets, comets, gas, galaxies and dust, and any other non-earthy bodies and phenomena. Astronomy and astrology were actually associated historically, but astrology is not a science, and it is no longer recognised to have anything to do with astronomy. Historically, astronomy was focused on the observations of heavenly bodies. 
Basically put, astrophysics involves the study of the physics of astronomy, and concentrates on the behaviour, properties and motion of the objects in the universe. However, modern astronomy includes many elements of the motions and characteristics of these bodies, and the two terms of astronomy and astrophysics are used interchangeably today. Modern astronomers tend to fall into two fields, the theoretical and the observational. Observational astronomers is often what we think about when we think of astronomy. This is observing the celestial objects of outer space, such as stars, galaxies and planets. There are actually types of observational astronomy, and they are divided up to how the objects are being observed. These include everything from basic light, light that we can see with our eyes, to radio waves, infrared, x-rays, gamma rays, microwaves and ultraviolet observations. Theoretical astronomers are in the area of astronomy scientists using mathematical models to better describe what we have just observed in the universe. And even to describe events that we cannot even observe with our current technology. Unlike most fields of science, astronomers are unable to observe a system entirely from birth to death. For example, stars and galaxies span millions if not billions of years, so there is no way to observe them from birth to death. So therefore, theoretical and observational astronomy tend to blend together, and then theoretical scientists use this information to create simulations and then they use these simulations to gain a better understanding of the universe that we live in. Astronomy is broken down into a number of subfields. This allows scientists to actually specialise in particular objects and phenomena. Planetary astronomers is an area of astronomy that is focused on learning about planets, moons, asteroids and comets. From this we can learn how the planets and other objects were formed, and what they are actually made of. There are scientists that just focus on our sun, and this is called solar astronomy. This can be a very important field of science, as the sun's activity is a major impact on the Earth. Stellar astronomy is the study of stars, including how they were formed, and what they are made of, and what the life cycle of a star actually is. This includes various types of stars and their final state including interesting objects like red giants, black holes, supernovas and neutron stars. Galactic astronomers study our galaxy, the Milky Way, whilst extragalactic astronomers peer outside of our galaxy to determine how the collections of stars form, change and die. Cosmologists focus on the universe in its entirety, from its violent birth of the Big Bang to its present evolution all the way to its eventual death. Astronomy is often about very concrete observational things, where cosmology typically involves large-scale properties of the universe, and these properties of the universe can be sometimes puzzling, if not invisible. For example, like string theory, dark matter and dark energy, and the notion of multiple universes. Astronomical observations rely on different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, and this is to study a wide range of objects in the universe. But as light waves become less or more energetic, they move slower or faster. More energetic radiation has shorter wavelengths, so they appear in the form of ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays. The less energetic objects emit longer wavelengths, and these are in infrared and radio waves. These spacecrafts and probes that go to the edge of our solar system can turn around and take a picture of our beautiful yet fragile planet. And this just shows us that we are just simply a small dot on a massive scale that is known as our universe. Astronomy is a very important part of our modern society. It gives us a great view of our natural environment and gives us a great understanding into maths and physics that we can use in our present day society. Okay, so now I'm going to, um, again, get back into the PowerPoint presentation.
And I do have to, I apologize that I do have to go through this. Um, I will probably have to have another system available. So we talked about the universe um, and we have a little bit idea of, of you know, when it started, what's in it and that type of stuff. But they also talked about uh, multiverses. So uh, current theories are that there may be more than one universe. And here's a little movie clip that kind of describes that. I mean, if the universe is everything that there is, you can't have two versions of it, right? Otherwise, the pair would really be everything, and what you started off calling the universe wasn't. The problem here is terminology. Physicists speaking informally often say universe when they really mean observable universe. That is, the part of the whole universe that we've so far been able to see. And it's perfectly fine to talk about multiple different observable universes. For example, an alien near the edge of our observable universe will see parts of the whole universe that we can't yet see because the light hasn't had time to reach us yet. But that's a well understood question and not what physicists normally talk about when they discuss multiple observable universes or multiverses. So let's cut to the chase. In physics, the word multiverse normally refers to one of three distinct and largely unrelated proposed physical models for the universe, none of which has been tested or confirmed by experiment, by the way. The three multiverse models are type 1, bubble universes or baby black hole universes. This is the most straightforward kind of multiverse. The basic idea is that perhaps there are other parts of the universe which are so far away that we will never see them, or are inside black holes, so similarly we will never see them. This kind of model was created as an attempt to explain why our universe is so good at making stars and galaxies and black holes and life. As the argument goes, if each of these separate mutually unseeable bubbles in the universe had slightly different laws of physics, then by definition we could only exist in one that had the right physical laws to allow us to exist. Like, we have to live in a universe where the Earth could form, because if the Earth couldn't form, then we couldn't be here. If you're not convinced by this logic, don't worry too much. There's not yet any experimental evidence for this kind of multiverse. Multiverse Type 2 Membranes and Extra Dimensions Inspired in part by the inability of the mathematics of string theory to predict the right number of dimensions for the universe we observe, string theorists propose the idea that perhaps what we think of as our universe is actually just a three-dimensional surface embedded within a larger super-universe with nine spatial dimensions. Kind of like how each page of a newspaper is its own two-dimensional surface embedded within our three-dimensional world. And of course, if space had nine dimensions rather than three, there'd be plenty of space for other three-dimensional surfaces that appeared, like ours, to be universes in their own right, but, like the pages of a newspaper, were actually part of a bigger whole. These kinds of surfaces are called membranes, or brains for short, and as a reminder, there is not yet any experimental evidence for this kind of multiverse. Multiverse Type 3 The Many Worlds Picture of Quantum Mechanics Surprisingly, physicists still don't fully understand how the collapse of the wave function in quantum mechanics happens, and the many worlds hypothesis makes an attempt at explanation by proposing that every possible alternate timeline for the universe is real, and they all happen in an ever-larger, ever-branching way. Like a universal choose-your-own-adventure where every possible story happens. If this were the case, we might not realize it because we'd be stuck living out just one of the infinitely many possible lives available to us. In some ways, Many Worlds is similar to the bubble multiverse model by proposing maybe anything that can happen does, and we just happen to exist in this series of happenings that were necessary for us to exist. If you're still not convinced by this logic, don't worry, there's not yet any experimental evidence for this kind of multiverse. Of course, if you want to get imaginative, you could also combine several of these models together into a multi-multiverse, a new super-speculative model based itself on speculative and experimentally unconfirmed models. But that's not to say that we couldn't test these multiverse hypotheses. For example, if our observable universe were really just one of many disconnected bubbles or membranes, and if it happened to collide with another bubble or membrane sometime in the past, then that collision would certainly have had some sort of effect on what we see when we look up at the night sky. On the other hand, the many worlds interpretation might be tested fairly soon, since experimentalists are becoming increasingly able to manipulate and control ever larger quantum mechanical systems in their labs. Systems that approach the line between the quantum realm and our everyday experience. So as always, we must remember that physics is science, not philosophy, and in our attempts to explain the universe that we observe, we have to make claims that can in principle be tested, and then test them. Okay, so...
Um, so we just talked about our universe, our visible universe, and possible other types of um, universes uh, as well. Um, and so now we're going to um, <clears throat> start talking about the speed of light in a light year. You know, we've been measuring things um, as far as distance is concerned of like light years. Um, and we've been measuring time since the Big Bang until our current universe, um, which is determined by the speed of light. So what I want you to do right now is everybody, I want you to force blink your eyes once, just like that. Force blink your eyes once, all right? That is about a second of time. In that blink of an eye's time, in one second, a photon of light travels 186,000 miles, the speed of light in a vacuum. And now think about how many seconds there are in a year. So we're talking about the speed of light, it's 186,000 miles per second. Well, let's find out how big or how, how distant light travels in one year. In order to do that, you have to figure out the number of seconds in a year. Um, does anybody want to estimate that? I mean, is it a thousand, a million, a billion? Um, if you want to, just un unmute your mic and shout out on the answer. Okay, nobody's willing to give a guess, but in any case, everybody knows that there's 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, 365 days in a year. You just multiply all those together and you get the number of seconds in a year. And it's over 31 million seconds in one year. So now what do we do is that we can define what a light year is, okay? Wait a minute. So a light year is the number of seconds in a year, 31 million, we've decided that, um, times the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second. So you multiply second times miles, and you get over 5.7 trillion miles that light travels in one year. And we call that one light year. Okay, so now we can now we can calculate the size of the observable universe. All right, so we know how long you know how how distant a light year is. It's it's five point seven trillion miles, and we multiply that times the time since the Big Bang, which is thirteen point seven billion years, and so you know you get a huge number. It's uh, seventy nine sextillion miles. Um, and that's that big number down there. And that's fundamentally 13.7 billion light years. And again, not thousands, not millions, not billions, not trillions, not quadrillions, not quintillions, but 79 sextillion miles, which gives us 13.7 um, billion light years. This is the observable universe, okay? The size and immensity that no human can even begin to understand. But wait. How do we know that the visible universe is 13.7 billion years old? Well, astronomers have uh, you know, some pretty good tools in their toolbox. Um, they take a look at the oldest stars. And from this and from some spectral analysis, and, and they can determine the redshift, which determines how far away um, that star is and how fast it's going. They also take a look at the rate of expansion of the universe. And again, they know that as well as the temperature of the cosmic background radiation. And then they extrapolate that to the Big Bang. I'm not gonna go through any of that, but suffice it to say, they've done the homework and the visible universe is 13.7 billion light years old. Okay, here's some interesting facts when we talk about light mass and, and time and so forth and so on. So if you have something, let's say a spaceship, the faster it goes, the heavy that spaceship gets. As that spaceship approaches the speed of light, its mass approaches infinity. And that really can't happen because the mass cannot go the speed of light because there's just not enough energy in the universe 
to accelerate it, then that's that, that thing. So mass can approach the speed of light, but cannot go over the speed of light. And as it approaches the speed of light, it gets heavier. The next thing is the fastest, the fastest something goes, the slower time goes. Now, this is not intuitive, but uh, hear me out. A photon with the characteristic of a paddle and a wave is massless, okay? And a photon at the speed of light, and it can travel at the speed of light because it's massless, feels no time. Time has stopped for that photon. And think about that. Um, so in other words, if you are traveling away from Earth in a spaceship at one quarter the speed of light for one year, and then you turned around and for one quarter the speed of light flew back to Earth in one year, everybody on Earth would have aged two years, but you would have only aged one year because time slows down the faster that you go. So in effect, you would have traveled one year into Earth's future, future if you could travel at the speed of light. So now we have an age of the size of the observable universe. It's 13.7 billion years old, and it's 27.4 billion years across. 27.4 is two times 13.7. So the edge of the universe is 13.7 to the Earth, and if you go on the other side, it's another 13.7. So 13.7 is the radius and 27.4 is the diameter of the actual universe. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a, uh, a, a spaceship, so to speak, from Earth out to the edge of the universe. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Contact. Um, it was out probably about 30, 40 years ago. Um, but they had a, an unbelievable intro that's very accurate and it's, it's, very, um, it's very interesting. So we're going to see that movie right now. That intro right now, not the movie. But you should see the movie. It's pretty interesting. So we're going to start at the Earth. And we're moving away from the Earth. Now that noise is just radio noise, radio broadcast. Being broadcast on Earth, going out into space, traveling at the light. Light. Now we see the sun. Still hear the radio. In the background is involved the Milky Way galaxy. The planet Uranus, very small. And now we're getting into the Cooper Belt, which is um, uh, a bunch of asteroids and the source of short-term comets that hit the Earth. Cooper Belt is about two light years away. And now we're seeing the nearest star to Earth. This is Alpha Centauri. There's actually a binary star system, and it's four light years away. We're continuing to go out into the Milky Way galaxy now. This is the Eagle Nebula, the Pillars of Creation, made famous, uh, a famous Hubble Im image uh, 7,000 light years away. There are many stars being formed in that gas and dust. We continue on out. Notice we don't hear the radio anymore. That's because we're beyond 100 light years, which is the bubble of radio waves traveled from the Earth since radio was invented on the Earth. Now we see the Milky Way galaxy. 
The Milky Way galaxy um, is about 150,000 light years across with about 100,000 million stars. Now we see multiple galaxies. We see galaxy clusters. We're getting to the edge of the universe at this point. No, I'm sorry, that is the Sombrero galaxy. And now we see multiple galaxies. We're going further and further out away from Earth. And now we see galaxy clusters. And then we see superclusters made up of galaxy clusters. And that's the edge of the universe. And again, I apologize to have to go through all of this again, but we will quickly get to the next slide. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about the universe now. And, and really it's, it's amazing to think about it. And sometimes it gives you shivers. Um, and so now we're gonna talk about stars, which is the fundamental things that happen in the universe. The universe is mostly hydrogen, um, like 99.9%. The rest of it is some helium and other trace elements. And so when we talk about stars, we're talking about that helium condensing together under gravity to form a star. Now, I mentioned what the nearest star was in the previous movie as we were moving out, and it was a binary system. Um, and I mentioned how far away it was, but in any case, um, what we have is not those stars because our sun is a star and it is the closest star. It's a totally amazing object at the center of our solar system, the source of all weather on earth and the source of all life on earth. Okay, I already gave you this. Um, what a star is made of, uh, basically they're made of helium, I mean hydrogen. Um, so I don't know why I can't get to the next slide here. Let me do this, okay, so there we go. All right, so um, hydrogen, uh, that um, the sun is made up of is 91%. Um, it's 8% helium and other stuff in there, just other um, um, yeah, chemical elements is 1%. Now the process by which hydrogen atoms join together to form helium inside the sun is two hydrogen atoms make one helium atom. That is nuclear fusion. That happens at the center of the sun and it's the source of all heat and light of the sun. This kind of gives you an idea of the size of the sun and a solar prominence from the sun and the size of the earth. The sun is huge. Now, again, I want you to blink your eyes because I'm gonna to talk to you about how big the sun is. All right, so force blink your eyes once. Remember, that is one second. The five billion years, the sun came into being five billion years ago. It didn't come into being at the beginning of the universe. It came in, it, it, it coalesced from the hydrogen in the universe to become our sun five billion years ago. So it has existed for five billion years. And every second since the beginning of the sun, five billion years ago, every second it has been fusing 600 million tons of hydrogen into 596 million tons of helium. Every second for 5 billion years, every second, 600 million tons. Now, an interesting uh, fact is the sun will last for another 5 billion years. For every future second, the blink of an eye, it will continue to burn nuclear fuel at 600 million tons of hydrogen every second for another 5 billion years. That means the sun is so big and it has so much hydrogen that it can burn 600 million tons a second 
for 10 billion years. We talked about 600 million tons of hydrogen into 596 tons of helium. Where did the other 400 million tons of stuff go? Well, a famous scientist kind of figured this out in his famous equation, E equals MC squared. Okay, it answers that question. Energy, which is the light and heat coming from the sun, equals the mass, which is those four tons per second, times the speed of light squared. So the energy coming out every second from the sun is huge. Now, what I want to do is I want to show you a NASA um, a video. It's, it's a beautiful NASA video of the sun. And this video speaks for itself. What you're going to see is an amazing sight of coronal rain. Um, coronal is the surface of the sun, seemingly appearing from space above the sun's surface. In the first part of the video, note the size of the Earth compared to the medium, this medium-sized solar flame. Okay, so again, to give you some sense of perspective as how big the sun is, um, these are the planets of the solar system. Um, and you see where Earth is um, as it relates to the sun, okay? Um, the sun actually is rather a rather small star, star and is somewhat unique in that it's a single star system. Um, most stars in the universe are multiple star systems, two or more stars orbiting each other. Remember, that only an extremely small fraction of the sun's energy bathes the earth. Nevertheless, listen to these astounding facts. The sun is 93 million miles away, 93 million miles away. The amazing thing about this is you can still see about a nickel sized disc in the sky. That's how big that thing is. It's 93 million miles away and you can still see the diameter. Okay. It takes an average of about 200,000 years for light energy photons from the nuclear reaction in the center of the sun to move to the sun's, uh, in the sun's core, to move um, to its surface. Now, 
you need to remember that the sun is radiating energy from its entire surface. It's a sphere, all right? And the earth is a speck somewhere. The earth is a speck. Wait a minute. I got it. I got it. The earth is a speck somewhere out here, okay? This little speck is the earth. And then only a little bit of the sunlight is being received by that earth, okay? As a matter of fact, it's a tiny fraction, about five, 10 billionths of the sun energy's output. Okay, so the sun is putting out all this energy. We're just getting a tiny, tiny little bit of it. But let me compare something with uh, something you might be familiar, not familiar with, but you know about. Um, you will not feel the heat from the largest nuclear bomb after about 50 miles. The largest nuclear bomb on Earth. You won't feel the heat of it after 50 miles. You feel the heat from the sun 93 million miles away. If you look at the sun, it'll burn your eyes in a few seconds from 93 million miles away. The sun can severely sunburn you in a few hours from 93 million miles away. And remember, we're only receiving a tiny, tiny portion of the sunlight from the sun. And if you have unprotected day-long exposure to sunlight, it will kill you in a few days from 93 million miles away. Okay, so I'm gonna do one more video about the sun. And this is about the sun's life, how it began, where it is now, and how it's gonna end in about 10 billion years, in 5 billion years from now. Our sun and other stars like it do not remain exactly as they appear now. Stellar lifetimes are much longer than ours, but like us, they progress through stages of life. The progression of these stages is connected to the formation of the planets and their fate in the events to come billions of years from now. In this tour, we investigate the life cycle of stars like our sun. The sun was born in a dense, cold cloud of gas, similar to this nearby cloud in the Perseus constellation. Within these clouds, gravity causes pockets of gas to collapse into individual stars. Collapse lasts about half a million years. A small amount of the gas collapses but remains in a disk around the forming star. Over several million years, the disk may form planets, like those in our solar system. Eventually, the center of the star becomes dense enough to fuse hydrogen atoms into helium atoms. This marks the transition to adulthood, and the star takes its place on the main sequence where it will spend much of its life. The main sequence appears as a band on this diagram, showing stars' brightness or luminosity versus their surface temperature. On the main sequence, a star's luminosity determines its mass, size, and future evolution. After hydrogen burning ends, stars leave the main sequence and move to other regions of the diagram. At 4.5 billion years old, our sun is middle-aged, and it is still on the main sequence. Over the next few billion years, the rate of hydrogen fusion will gradually increase, causing the sun's temperature to increase and its radius to swell. This will cause Earth's oceans to evaporate, and the Earth will take on an appearance more like Venus, whose surface is molten. Five billion years from now, the Sun's supply of hydrogen will run out. Once the hydrogen in its core is gone, the Sun will leave the main sequence and become a red giant star, its luminosity produced by fusion helium atoms. During this stage, the outer layers of the sun will expand until it is 200 times its current size, or almost 100 million miles in radius. This new size is larger than the orbits of Mercury and Venus. They will be swallowed by the expanding star. If Earth's orbit increases, it will survive, or it may be swallowed as well. The sun will then resemble Mira, this nearby red giant star. The red giant phase will last a few million years until all the helium in the core also runs out. The sun will then undergo a cataclysmic upheaval, throwing off its outer layers and contracting to become a white dwarf. The discarded layers are visible as planetary nebulae like this one. 
the name Planetary Nebula, comes from early astronomers who noticed that these objects look similar to the atmospheres of gas giants like Jupiter. They do not actually form planets. Planetary nebulae do help to enrich the universe with carbon and other heavy elements, such as those that we ourselves are made of. As a white dwarf, the sun will be about the size of the Earth. Nuclear fusion will no longer occur, but it will still be luminous because its temperature will remain at thousands of degrees. Over tens of billions of years, a white dwarf will cool until it is dim and cold, a black dwarf. The time for a white dwarf to cool completely is longer than the current age of the universe. This means that there are no black dwarfs now for us to observe in order to better understand our sun's final fate trillions of years in the future. Okay, so nothing to worry about uh, as far as our sun is concerned um, while we are living. All right, we're getting to the end here. So let's uh, quickly go through these again. And okay. So um, if you go outside after this presentation, lay on your back and look straight up at the zenith, which is the point in the sky straight up, um, you will see all of the stars in this image of the night sky for May 12, 2020. This is how the stars will look on May 12, 2020. Um, stars shift, actually the stars don't shift, but the earth rotates and it, uh, it rotates around the sun as well. So this view right here only happens on May 12, 2022. So in the future, when you look up at the night sky and see all of those stars, well, yes, it is a beautiful sight, you now know more about the universe stars in our sun. This will better allow you to understand and appreciate what you are really looking at. What you will see through your eyes and your mind's eye is so much more than just points of light. And your sense of beauty, wonder, and awe will hopefully want you to learn more about other astronomy phenomena and wonders. One final thought. Astronomy is a science, not a belief. Um, you can have a belief in anything. You can believe the earth is fat, flat. Um, you can believe the sky is pink. You can believe anything you want. Um, but uh, uh, science doesn't do that. Science takes a look at the information and the data, um, makes hypotheses about that, uh, and then sets up an experiment, tests that hypothesis, and analyzes the results. And not only the scientists are doing that, but all the other scientists around the world can do the same thing. And they're always trying to prove one theory wrong. And so science is the pursuit of an application of knowledge and understanding of the natural world using a systematic methodology based on evidence, not on beliefs. Okay, we have one more clip, I guess. So yeah, let's do this. What is science? This is actually pretty good. I like this one. Science is curiosity in action. Science is looking for answers so that you can make better questions. Science is a process. It's a set of rules we follow to test and falsify ideas. Science is an invitation to ask the world how it works. Science is a method of thought. So it refers to how you do things rather than what answer you get. A method of thought that seeks to explain the physical world. That doesn't mean it actually will explain, because maybe the explanation you are looking for turns out to be completely wrong. It seeks to explain the physical world because it doesn't look at important elements of the world that are not physical. For example, science doesn't deal with love, jealousy, justice, morality. Anything that is science can be tested and, if the data come out a certain way, proven wrong. A hypothesis is an educated guess about how something works. 
Science is how we test to see whether our guess is right or wrong. So why do we do science? To translate our individual wondering about how the world works into testable questions, which others can also get involved in. So that we can understand why animals do what they do and how they do it. We do it for fun. <laughs> in order to explain existence, causation, relationship, and interaction. So our collective knowledge grows. So that we can understand the causes of problems like pollution, disease, and climate change and fix them. So that we can advance and balance the well-being of all life forms. Okay, so um, that's about it for uh, this program. Um, I have a few more things to say, however. Um, really, okay, let's get to the end here. All right. Um, thank you for sharing this with me. Um, but there's going to be more um, coming up in the in the future. Um, so three other programs that uh, we're talking about is See the Universe, um, the various ways astronomy uses technology to explore electromagnetic spectrum and gravity to understand and image the universe. And then imaging the universe, how the eye, binoculars, telescopes, and other instruments view and capture celestial images by using image, various amateur techniques. E, uh, for example, pinhole cameras, cell phone cameras, SLR cameras, et cetera, with the emphasis on how everyone can become an astrophotographer. And then outdoor star parties, in-person hands-on exploration of the night sky using the eye, binoculars, and telescopes to see the moon, planets, binary stars, star clusters, galaxies, and nebulas. So check back for future dates uh, in, in, the, in the continuing TMCC astronomy programs. And you can check that out at uh, www.timmountain.org. Um, if you have any questions after this presentation or suggestions um, as to what you would like to explore in future TMCC astronomy programs, email me at info at tinmountain.org. This is your host, Dan Noren. Have a good night and always look up. All right, Dan, thank you so much for that. Um, I have to be honest, I, I am totally overwhelmed uh, with the, the massive amount of information you just put out there at us. Um, but I, but I thoroughly, um, I thoroughly appreciate it. We have, um, we did have a question that came in and actually I had an associated question with this. So I'm going to, um, if you're up for it, read, read um, you know, a few questions that came in through the chat. Um, and if anyone wants to add to those, you can um, type them in or uh, momentarily, you can also unmute yourself um, and ask those questions directly of Dan. But, but I do believe this, uh, you know, this first question that came in um, is, is maybe from, is from one of your family members. Um, and that is, uh, why is the sun's expenditure of hydrogen or helium measured in tonnage weight and not by volume? Because, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, you want me to uh, share uh, the screen here? Let's do this. Let's just bring this back up again and you can see me. Here we go. All right, so uh, it could be either, all right? Um, you can do it by, by volume, you can do it by mass. Normally when you're talking about um, molecules and atoms and stuff like that, you deal with, um, you deal with mass because the, the volume of an atom uh, really is just mostly an empty space. You have the nucleus in the middle and you have the electrons spinning around the nucleus. And by far, most of that is unbelievably empty space. Um, so you can do either one, uh, but the preferred method uh, and the standard method is by using mass 
And to tell you the truth, most people understand tons rather than they understand um, uh, uh, 60 liters squared. So that is, uh, hopefully that answered your question. Right, and um, and so my follow up was, you know, about when when you showed the image of or the video of the solar flare, um, and maybe this is dabbling into sort of uh, celestial imaging, but um, was that image captured by chance, or did they with with an event like a solar flare? Is it is it fairly spontaneous or um, are there keys that, that might indicate that that's something like that is about to happen? You really can't predict um, uh, any particular solar flare. And as a matter of fact, um, it, the sun has a cycle of 12 years um, where it's called a minimal. Um, we don't even get any sunspots or solar flares and over a 12 year period, um, it'll peak out and you have a lot of sunspots and a lot of flares. We're approaching that now with our sun. And then it goes back down again for 12 years into the minimum. Now, sunspots um, and solar flares are basically a phenomena um, created by the magnetic field of the sun. Now, the magnetic field of the sun is immense, just as the sun is immense. And what you see on the surface of the sun is plasma, it's hot gas. Um, at the fourth state of matter. And the sun is about 6,000 degrees at the surface. The sun is about 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now those flares that you see are an effect of sunspots with the magnetic field warping the plasma and shooting it out into space. Um, and some of these can be pretty dangerous. I don't know if, if you remember the, the blackout um, that started in Canada, and this was back in the 60s. Um, and the whole East Coast, Coast was the, the electric grid was blacked out. But that was caused by a solar flare. The sun sent out so much energy when it burped like that, um, that that energy reached the earth. And uh, just as electricity is, is manufactured in the generator, that energy is, gets into the, the, uh, uh, the, the wires of the power system and stuff like that and creates more electricity and wipes out the generators and stuff like that. But you talked about the corona, um, and I'm not sure, can you re, re uh, kind of focus that question so I can truly answer your question? Um, so my, my question was in capturing that um, imaging, was that, um, was that by chance or did they, were there indications that that would occur? No, it wasn't by chance because they're looking at the sun 24-7, 365. They have a bunch of satellites that are doing that. And they have a bunch of observatories that when the sun is up, they're looking at the sun, okay? Um, there is no way to predict, predict that a, a solar prominence or solar flare is going to happen. It's just that they've been looking at it constantly. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, I wasn't sure about that. Um, all right, wonderful. Does anyone else have any questions for Dan? know that he has he has packed us full of information um but if you do feel free to um to unmute yourself and ask him um dan i have i have another question for you yeah. um, and that is um and i know that that this may be tricky especially because this is um you know such a vast uh and encompassing topic but you know, of astronomy, but do you, what is, you know, what, what is your, is for lack of a better word, favorite aspect of astronomy? Like what, um, what do you find your, what aspect do you find yourself most drawn to? Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, we've just been through all of the stuff and, and really just touched on um, what's out there and so forth and so on. But my, my core um, passion is cosmology. Um, to understand the beginning uh, and, and the ongoing and the end of the universe. Um, it, because it just fascinates me more than anything else. I mean, we can think about the universe as it is now and it's 13.7 billion light years across. 
And certainly that's more than enough to keep anybody busy their entire lifetime. Okay, um, but you take a look at a star and you understand what a star is, like a sun and so forth and so on. You take a look at a galaxy, you kind of understand what a galaxy is. Um, you take a look at nebula, you take a look at uh, um, uh, galaxy clusters and you see data and stuff, data that um, shows that these are even larger super clusters and stuff like that. And there's, there's been a lot of work on that, um, but the cosmology is more theoretical um, and they're trying to, um, through science, through uh, getting data, making hypotheses, testing that, and so forth and so on, um, to understand how do we get here and, and where are we going? And, and in a sense, it's the same thing I think everybody asks themselves. Why am I here? And where am I going? And so that's what fascinates me. Oh, that's great, because that's like the... <laughs> That's like the part that's so that I, I feel like I struggle with because it's so the theoretical aspect. It's so hard to wrap your, your head around so much of this. So um, so that is wonderful. Um, well, Dan, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm so glad that we we managed to, to connect and put this together. And I am looking forward to uh, to future programs, especially um, being able to get out and do some uh, some stargazing and um, and identification. Yeah, that's that's the really fun part um, when you get the hands on with the telescope when you see things. And again, you know, here, here's the here's the issue with that. Um, you know, you can look up at the night sky. You can even see a galaxy with your with your naked eye. Um, it's the Andromeda galaxy, and it's by the W um, constellation, Cassiopeia, if you know where to look. Um, and so you can see galaxies with the, with the naked eye. But with a telescope, um, you're looking at Andromeda, and again, it doesn't look like the picture that you've seen galaxies, okay? Um, it's a smudge in the sky that's about the size of the thumb. And, and, but it's, it's the, the um, understanding of what you're looking for, what you're looking at. Um, it's, you know, that smudge becomes now billions and billions of stars and stars are, you know, uh, in, in the beginning of creation in, in, in their midlife and then they're gonna die and there might be planets around that and so forth. So it's a cerebral um, type of, of event more than anything else, okay? And once you, once you see it, you're gonna say, oh, that doesn't look too good. Well, that doesn't look very impressive. But if you understand what you're looking for, you, you go, wow, I'm really looking at that. And I'm, I'm looking at billions and billions of stars and it looks like a smudge type of thing. So yeah, um, and so, but the star parties were a lot of fun. People get their hands on with equipment. That's what they want. Um, you can see the moon, the moon is spectacular. Um, you can see the planets and the moons around the planets, they're spectacular. Um, and and uh, you, know, you can see double stars. And some of them are just absolutely beautiful. One of them is blue and the other one's orange. You can see colors. So yes, the stat body is, is uh, you know, we should have a bunch of those. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all for, for coming in on this, um, on this lovely uh, spring evening. And, um, and we look forward to more programming. Okay, have a good night, everybody. <laughs>